The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to our distance education lesson for today. I am Bangoye Frederick, your human biology teacher. To begin this lesson, I would like us to look at the assignment we had in the previous lesson. Therefore, we had a task which we had to do to consult reference materials and other like. And the task was as follows. A house is to be constructed in your village to be used as a school. You, as a human biology student, what advice would you give to the building committee? Remember, that house will be used as a school. Therefore, from your biological perspective, what would you say? What guidance would you give? If you had reflected on our previous lesson and even consulted reference material, you would have had responses that look like this. When you think of the site, where should the school be located? Should it just be located anywhere? You realize that it should not be too far from the local dwellings, otherwise it will take too long for the learners to reach the school. And then there should be ease of access, meaning the, the, the place it should be linked by a good road network so that people will be able to have access to the school. And then there should be a source of water so that the learners or the teachers together should be able to have water to drink during the day or at the time they are in school. And then it should have a large play space for sports and relaxation of learners because it shouldn't be too tight. Because when they play and relax, they will exercise their muscles, and that is a biological function. You also look at suitability and the comfort of that area. And in this aspect, you have to think of how spacious are the rooms. Will the rooms be spacious enough to take maybe 10, 20, 30, or 40 learners? Or how many learners are intended to be in a particular room? You have to think of the passageways for the handicapped. Should there be some learners who are having some uh, difficulty in movement, be able to reach the class, or in that case, how do you construct the staircase and all the like? It should have wide doors and windows for proper ventilation, and therefore a foundation should be solid with walls, and these should aim to preempt uh, accidents. Because if the walls and the foundation are not solid, then the risk of collapsing is high, and you can understand if a building collapses when the school is going on. Many learners will certainly maybe have uh, wounds, uh, whatever, and some may die, which will be unfortunate. Therefore, this biological advice is very imperative when constructing a house. And that is the place where the human biology student finds himself or herself. And with this teaser, it leads us now to our lesson for today. We shall continue talking about clothing and shelter. But at this point, our focus is going to be on the second aspect of housing. We have seen it in the earlier lessons. And to realize this, we shall look at the objectives, previous knowledge, look at the real life situation, carry out some lesson activities with some exercises. And of course, we shall end with an assignment to do our, pre our pre precious or private time. Then, to actually understand or to prove that you have understood the contents of this lesson, we expect that before the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe the types of houses in relation to their uses. And you should also be able to describe the features of a foundation, the walls, and the roof of a habitable house. That's a house that is suitable for people to live in. Now, with this, if you have an understanding of the general features of a house, for human habitation. And remember, this was what we saw in the previous lesson. 
Therefore, this previous knowledge is necessary to enhance your understanding of this content. At this point, we look at a real life situation. Your elder brother has just graduated from the university and got to do a volunteer teaching service in the city with very little compensation, meaning that he will be paid a very low salary or just a small stipend. Then, as a human biology student, what advice would you give him in relation to housing? Should he go and live 20 kilometers away from where he is working? Or should he live just a few meters from the place? Should he go and rent an apartment that costs a lot of money? Or should he rent a small room or maybe a room and a parlor that is suitable for him? You will be able to determine this based on the income and other factors that favor living conditions. From this, we observe that in the city, actually, there are difficult housing conditions for low income earners. Therefore, you need to take a lot of precautions. You need to use a lot of criteria before you can situate yourself where you can live comfortably. I would like us now to observe this diagram below or this picture, and then we deduce what may be bad about it. These are camp houses. In these houses, you will see that here, they are hanging on support. They have the foundation here, or maybe a concrete, but they are hanging on support here. And you realize that we are looking for what may be bad in it. When you look at it, you see that if there is a strong wind from this direction, it can easily carry off these houses. Therefore, living in these camp houses, you risk being blown off one day if you have a strong wind. Or maybe, how durable are these supports? You realize that they may not be durable for a number of years. Therefore, the durability is limited. And also, you realize that here, this is uh, some sort of an isolated area where these houses have been constructed for a camp, meaning that a group of people will live here to carry out a particular task. And if so many people are living in one house, look at the pillars that are carrying the weight. Then the people or the occupants may be too heavy. And in so doing, the house may collapse because the support is limited. Therefore, you as a biology student, you are able to, you should be able to look at houses and determine this kind of criteria before you determine how suitable or not the house or the houses are good for habitation. With this, I would like us to look at indicators of housing. And these are based on economic, they are based on the physical and the social factors. And looking at the physical factors of housing, you think of A or maybe pollution, the windward side of the slope, in which direction is the wind blowing. Therefore, if you make your door at the direction from which the wind is blowing, then there will always be wind in the house, a lot of air in the house. And one day it may blow off the house. Therefore, you should be able to look at the direction before you can put the doors and maybe windows. Look at the lighting. How will the house be lit? How available will be water? Will there be a water source which is portable? What about sewage disposal? What about drainage? Noise? Root network? How linked is that house? You have to take care of all of these when you are constructing a house. And when you are looking at economic factors, economics here related to money, finances, how much does it cost to build that house? If I were to rent, how much will it cost to rent that house? Will it be too much or will it be within the reach of my means? The taxes that are involved, how much taxes has to be paid? What is the cost of the land? What are the land tenure laws and all of that? And then you also think of the expenditure on the utilities on the building. Maybe you have to pay high bills for electricity, for water and all the like. Will these be able to suit your income? Then you also consider the social indicators of housing. And in social aspects here, we are talking of prevention of diseases because no matter how good the house is, as long as you are living in it and you are sick, you will never enjoy that house. Therefore, health, health aspects are very important to consider in housing. And then, ask yourself, what about the water sources? Is it contaminated or is it good water? Is that area overcrowded or is the house itself overcrowded? What about the possibility of insect-borne diseases? and vermin such as rats, cockroaches, and all the like. Are they there? What about proximity to wild animals? Maybe there are elephants around that can blow off or maybe push down the house one day. What about the crime wave? Is it a jungle or is it an area where there's no law and justice? What about access to medical facilities? All of these questions need to be asked. And when these are provided, then you realize that that habitation would be good for humans 
and it will be suitable for you. But if you can respond to this in the negative, therefore it may not be good for habitation. Some of the social indicators, like we have said also, could in include the following. When you are looking at how comfortable you will be, you think of heat, thermal comfort. Maybe the house is made in a way that it is poorly ventilated and there's a lot of heat inside. You will not be able to sleep, therefore you will feel a lot of discomfort. What about ability to see? Is it dark or is it lit? What about spatial comfort? What about equity or to disability and access? Maybe you have a problem with your leg or maybe you have difficulty, you are using a wheelchair and all the like. How comfortable will it be for you to access that house? So these are social aspects that need to be taken into consideration when we are locating a house, either to construct for ourselves or to live. And this will lead us to the type of houses and homes. When we talk about the type of houses and homes, you see that this will depend much to, on the location, on the size and the age, and maybe the kind of family that you have and the intended use of that house. Because houses are not just constructed, they have the aim, how they will be used will determine how the house is constructed. And based on all of this, we have the following kind of houses. We have what we call the bungalow. And what could, how could a bungalow look like? You see that a bungalow actually is a house with only one level. It doesn't have uh, maybe a floor, the floor above, that you have a story building with the first floor, second, and all the like. So this kind of house is what we call a bungalow. And it, most of them do not actually have stairs, like you see in this one. There's no stairs, even at the door, it's just on a flat surface. You just walk and you get access to the house. And they are commonly found in the countryside, not mostly in where there's a lot of uh, land for building. So we see that here, in this habitation here, these are a number of bungalows that have been constructed. This looks like a touristic area, of, an area where people go for picnic. So you see that these are bungalows. These kind of houses are called bungalows. Then we also look at a detached house. How does it look like? You see that a detached house actually is house that's on its own. It's not joined to any other house. It's a single house. It may be made of many apartments, but it's a single house which is not joined to other houses. So you realize that a house like this is not joined to any other one. It's called a detached house. And then we also have a semi-detached house which looks like this. You see that this one is a house that's joined to another house on one side or the other. And these are very common in towns. So you see this one here, this is a house here. See another one joined to it behind there. It is common in town because of limited land, and limited space. Therefore, when there's space, they maximize it. We also have what we call a terraced house. And how does it look like? You see that a terraced house actually is a house that is attached to other houses on both sides. And this is very common in big cities, in the, especially in developed countries. So here you can see that along the street, you cannot know whether this is one house or these are several houses. So here you see that they have just built a long line of houses which are continuous. So this kind of construction of houses is what we call a terraced house because each house is linked to the other. And therefore, to identify these houses, you should use numbers. The houses should be named. Therefore, you are, known, you are living in house name this or house number that on street that, that and all the like. So we call that terrace house. We also have an apartment or a flat. An apartment or a flat actually is a group of rooms which make up a home. And when we look at this building here, we see that uh, this is a story building that has several floors. And in each floor, you have several apartments. And in each apartment, you have several rooms. Depending on the intended use and on how many people will live in each apartment, the rooms can vary and the plan can vary. So this is often smaller than some of the other houses we have looked at, but it's usually found in an apartment block. Apartment block means that there's one block. This one is one block of house, but you see apartments inside. And even if you look around where you are living, if you are living in the city, you'll be able to see such kind of houses. And such houses will have several families living on it. Several families will live in this house because you can only live according to the size of your family. Then, we have a caravan. And how does it look like? You see that a caravan house is one that can be moved from one place to the other. And this type of home actually suits people who like to move from one area to the other, maybe for picnics during holidays, for tourist sites and other like. So here we can see 
This is a house here that has wheels. When they want to move, they will just connect and then they will just be as if it is a vehicle. But when they go and park it somewhere and open, it will become a house and they will stay there. So it just looks exactly like a vehicle. So you can see one here. This one here, which is called a scam caravan, caravan. You can see it here. It's quite a small one, but it looks as if it is a bike or a tricycle. But it has been made in the way that you can close it and you can sleep inside. So these are what we call caravan houses. When the tourists are moving, they don't go to rent, they just move with their houses and they are their vehicles. Then we also look at a cottage. We also have a cottage. This is usually one story house and it looks like this. The roof is usually covered with straw or thatched roof. You can see it here, covered with straw. And then they are mostly found in the countryside and poor communities. These persons may not have enough money to buy corrugated iron sheet or tiles to put their roof. Therefore, these houses are what we call cottages. We call them cottages. You can look at another one here, which is nice made. So see that this roof is made of grass or straw, depending on where the house is constructed and what is available. This therefore would be cheaper, but it's also less durable because it will get decayed maybe in just a few years, and that roof will need to be changed. So we call that the cottage. We also have a farmhouse, and these houses are actually found in, house, in farms. Maybe the farm where you are rearing animals, you are growing crops, and all the like. Because when you are in the farm, you will need to stay. You need to harvest crops and keep some. The animals need to stay, and all the like. So these are often surrounded by lots of farmyard, and the farmer's animals usually live in these fields. So we can see a good example here. This is a farmhouse. A farmhouse, take note, does not necessarily mean that it is not nicely constructed. It is simply a house that is constructed in the farm area where you keep your crops, you keep your animals, you go and do your farming, you come back to the city and all the like. You realize that in the city you can have houses that are of much lower quality than this. Therefore, do not misunderstand a farmhouse for a poor quality house. Refer it to a house which is constructed in a farm area and it is used when the farming activity or agricultural activities are going on. I would also like us to look at this kind of houses here. You see that this is a house that's on slits. Look at it. It's raised up there. These are steels that are constructed here. And then the house is up. This kind of house could be constructed in an area where maybe there's a lot of flooding so that when there is water, it will flow under, but it will not destroy the people or the house and the persons who are inside. So in such a situation where you risk having floods, such houses can be constructed. Like you could see, they cannot be very large houses, but they can always be of a certain size. Also look at this one, this is a houseboat, like we have seen caravan houses. This one can, is a boat, but it is a house. So you can just move with it in the sea, and you live in it just as if it is a normal house, but you can move. So this is a houseboat, which is constructed on a boat, usually for tourists or people who want to go for holidays and all the like. You can also look at this, this is a tent house. It's made of tent, maybe tarpaulin, polythene material. This is usually temporary. You construct it when you have maybe a few days or some activity to carry out. When you construct that, it's called a tent house. And after a few days or weeks that you are staying there, you can dismantle it, and then you move to another location. We also have this one. This is a villa. These are houses for the rich. Because to construct this house, you see that it has even a swimming pool here, and then it has a lot of facilities where you relax and all the like. So these kind of houses are actually called villas. They're houses for the rich. We also look at castle or maybe palaces. We look at these two palaces here. When we look at this one, you see that this is constructed like a bungalow. It's a group of houses that are linked together. This is a palace, and this is also a palace. So what determines the quality of these two houses? This is certainly the financial ability of maybe the kings or the chiefs who are living there. There's no difference between this house and this one in terms of status. All of them are kings or maybe chiefs. But now, depending on the financial main and also depending on where these palaces are constructed, you can have structures that look like this. When you look at this, you note that this structure is surely in the desert area. Because if there was rain, look at the roof. There's no channel for flow of rainwater. But here, it is in a place which has rain. Although the roof is of touch, when it's raining, you see that water can flow over. We also look at this one. This is a hut. This we call it a hut. And we also look at this. This is also a hut. These are two different huts. 
So what could be the difference? All of them are right. The clear difference here, all of them maybe could be owned by people who are not financially uh, very stable, they may have low income. But this one is constructed of straw. But this one, the roof is straw, but down here may be some brick or some wood or some mud. So you see that all of them are hurt and they are constructed depending on where they find themselves. Let's also look at bands like this one. This is a band maybe in a farm or at home where crops are stopped. Maybe they have harvested maize, millet, sorghum, or whatever, distorted. It is constructed of straw. And why is it with this straw? You see that it is warm. It will allow it to pass through. Therefore, the food which is inside will be warm enough and will keep dry. It will not be moist. If it were constructed on material which is weak, then the food inside could be moist and then the food could be destroyed, maybe by mold or other fungi. Also look at this barn here, constructed with some mold kind of support and then the food is stored here. So you realize that in a traditional setup, there have been indigenous methods of constructing all of these facilities so that they could keep food and use in times of need. We also look at this one, it's also a barn, but this one is advanced. This is constructed with uh, high quality material, maybe corrugated iron sheets, zinc, iron, and all the like. So all of these, they store food, but what determines their construction is the technical know-how of the persons, their financial ability, and the location where they find themselves. Then we we'll also share some features of some geographical factors of houses in the global perspective. This is what is called a yacht. These houses are found in Mongolia. You see that it is constructed in some form of a tarpaulin. That's a polystyrene kind of material. They will decorate it and they will construct it like that. When you look at this kind of house, you could imagine that it's a very windy area and it doesn't have windows. Meaning that if there's a lot of wind, this material is polystyrene, so it's not permeable. Air wouldn't pass through. Therefore, it will prevent the persons inside from being exposed to wind. So in, for them to adapt to this environment, they construct their houses like this. So in Mongolia, they call them the yacht. We also look at these stone and mud houses in desert. You see like in the previous palace where we saw, it doesn't have roof. This is a desert because there's no rain. Therefore, they do not need to put corrugated iron sheets for runoff because there's no rain. Therefore, they do not need that. So the houses, they are constructed as such. Then we have one called the igloos. These ones are constructed in Iceland of snow. Look at this guy here. He's wearing thick clothing to keep warm because of snow. Look at the house there, constructed of blocks of snow or maybe ice. So you can see this is how people adapt to live wherever they are living. Then you also have houses in the sea. You can see people swimming here. But see how they have constructed some houses there on steels on water. So those houses are hanging. So they can swim around here and then they just swim and go and climb and sleep in the houses. But take note that these houses, they go with their advantages and they go with their disadvantages. We shall see them subsequently. Also look at this one, which is constructed on a tree. What could be the factor making someone to construct a house in the tree? This area certainly maybe is inhabited maybe by lions, by elephants, or other wild animals. Therefore, if you are sleeping on the ground, on the ground, then these animals can even eat you up at night. Therefore, the people who construct their houses high up in trees, so that when they are sleeping, they at least they are safe from these animals that cannot climb trees. So you can understand how people have been living in various aspects or in various parts of the world depending on their means. With this, I would like us to look briefly as constructing a safe house. What would you need to do? There is supposed to be a technical study of the site and the plan which is done by technicians. Then the perimeter of the foundation which forms underground and plumbing pipes. The earth under the home should be treated for termites and maybe rats and others. And then there should be reinforcement of steel which is placed in the foundation and the slab so that the, the house would not collapse in the near future. Therefore, we see here that in making a foundation of a house, you first dig it, then you put concrete and then steel in it. And after digging, you see that it is being lined, that you see this guy walking here. And after that, you see that they put iron. These are iron rods that have been placed to make it more solid. And then when you build it, you have to line it with concrete as such. With this, you realize that your foundation will be solid enough to carry that house and you can even line up concrete on the floor. When you have done that, what about the blocks and the walls? Depending on your means and where you find yourself, these are blocks of earth and these ones are what called cement blocks made maybe of sand and cement. 
So realize that when you make like this, you construct the walls as such so that they could be solid. And when you do it, you should put a beam, this beam up there with iron rods so that it should make the house more solid. And when you have done that, what about the roof? It's completed usually with wood or maybe at times some iron and plywood is placed on trusses. But the windows are also installed with screws that will sink into the block. We can look at this house here. So you see how it is being constructed. This actually is a house constructed of wood. And you can see the roof. Our interest here is to see how the roof is being constructed. And this is a house which is constructed in the rainy area so that when it rains, the water can flow above. You can also look at this one where the roof structure is constructed with tiles and you can see what is happening. You can look at the windows here and the doors where they are placed. See that those are for ventilation. Then we also look at the electrical wiring and plumbing. You realize that here, look at, you see that these are pipes that run in various areas. And then up here, you can see electric cables are there. And these are usually done before the finishing. You should do the wiring and the plumbing before the finishing of the house. And when you have done that, you see that when you finish a good house, which is habitable, you see that it will look something like this. And you can look at the exterior. So you can see the entrance here is already painted. Look at the main door, the windows, the roof, and all the like. So finishing depends also on your means. And when you are finished, you also do landscaping. Landscaping means that you arrange the area, the surround, what we call the back, the feedback. You see that the pushback here, you see here is this part is paved and this also another passage which is here where you can walk and you can see lawns, green lawns here. So in this kind of uh, house, you can be able to have a lot of space and you can design, make your flower beds, you make your orchards, you can even make your swimming pool and all the like. Therefore, the finishing and landscaping are very imperative in housing. When you have done that, the next thing is the appliances which are installed in the house, maybe including a carpet, and the power source, maybe it is a solar or electrical, maybe hydropower and all the like. So here we see a house here where some equipment has been placed. You see some materials have been placed there for use. And we can also see up here. Remember, all of these, they depend largely on your financial ability. And when that has been done, you realize that this is a home now which is complete. And if it has a lot of space, you can see the children playing around with their bicycle and that is the residential area. So you can live comfortably in that kind of home when all of these fa factors have been provided. With this notion of housing, where to construct, how to construct, and all of these, let us reflect again on our real life situation. It was that your elder brother has just graduated from the university and got to do a volunteer job in the city where he would pay very little. And then you were asked to advise him on how he would live. Where would he choose a house? With this notion that we have had, we could reflect and we could say that he would be advised to locate the house near the school and this would help him to reduce his transport cost. He should also locate a single room house, which is of a lower standard, so that he should be able to pay because the payment of rent may require much money. And since he is receiving less compensation, he should live within his means. He should therefore also check the proper ventilation of that house to avoid airborne infections, and you should check how solid the house is. It should not be a house that, with the slightest wind, the house will be blown off because he may risk his life. With this, I would like us also to look at these houses here. But when we look at it, we see that it is these are houses that are located in sea, maybe some small islands which have been constructed. But our interest here is what benefits and risk may be associated with this type of housing. What will the benefits of people living in this housing here? And although it is in the sea, there are benefits and there are risks. Let us start with the benefits. What are the possible benefits? You see that there is proximity to the source of food, which is fish. Because people living here, you could easily catch fish even with a hook. Catch one and you eat and you get proton. There is a cheaper cost of transport to the fishing side. Because you just walk a few steps and you are able to do your fishing. You can see from this house, you just put your hook and you do your fishing there. You don't need to pay a boat and all the like. And then you realize that there's re reduced risk, maybe of crime wave, because people who are living there are people who should know how to swim. Therefore, not very many people will be there and the rate of crime will be reduced. There's also low cost of rent because of the risk involved. And then there's also reduced risk of overcrowding. 
Because many people who come there to do fishing may like to live in one house, therefore they will be overcrowded there. So these are some of the benefits that you could have from this house. But on the other side, what could be the risk involved? So you see that there's increased chances of deaths from drowning because the slightest uh, increase in the water level, the house can be carried away and you can easily drown. There's high exposure to mosquitoes and then there's also uh, high chances of being submerged by sea waves and then there's inadequate supply of food, maybe wood for drying fish because you have to use a boat to go to somewhere where you can bring wood to dry your fish. And there's also reduced proximity to, proximity to health, education, and other facilities because it's quite uh, isolated. Therefore, people only go there to do these activities and maybe people go there too for touristic uh, uh, aims. With this, dear learners, I would like us to take this assignment and do at our private time. The task goes as follows. With your knowledge of housing, identify and state the uses of the key rooms that should be included to make a healthy home. Look at your home. Define and explain the room that should be there to make that room a healthy home. And if you are doing this assignment, I will employ you to consult materials such as this one, we will consult it. And together with our previous lesson, you will have rich materials to give in terms of this assignment. And with this, dear learners, we have come to the end of this lesson. Our next lesson shall be uses and care of the house. See you in the next lesson. Una tege si, ma tege yob. Una tege minga, ma tege nyum. Una tege majang, ma tege ndom. Mane tambia ninya ne injubiayen. Ngani bana, ma tege mot. Ngani la kiri wa tege ndong. Esa tina bia dinki do. Mane tambia ninya ne injubiayen. Tam tama mote tam zabike. Tam tama tonge tam zabike tam tam tama mote tam zabike mane tambia ninya ne injubiyen 